So if you guys don't take anything from this presentation, uh, if you guys only remember one thing, I mean, you guys uh, say, I, don't, I haven't read any books on this issue. I, I don't know Mormonism. I don't even know my Bible very well. Knock, knock, knock. Or you got a friend at lunch with you. If you can just remember one thing, I'm telling you straight up front, just one thing, one verse, Isaiah 43, verse 10. So that Temple Square, when we have uh, people coming by, we like to talk with them if, if, they'll, if, if they're willing. But the sister missionaries that work at Temple Square, they're told not to talk to us, not to stop and have conversation with us by their, by their superiors. And so they come out and by, the, you know, by a, at a dozen at a time, and they're going back to their apartments. And so I've, I've, I've got 15 seconds with them. I don't get to have a relationship with them. And I don't get to have a conversation with them. So I say, do me a sister, do me a favor, sisters. Just one favor, please, please, please look at Isaiah 43.10. And that's the Isaiah 43.10 guy again. Isaiah 43.10, Isaiah 43.10, Isaiah 43.10. Oh, yeah, yeah, we heard you before last week. Oh, yeah, Isaiah 43.10. Because Mormonism says, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. That's called the Lorenzo Snow Couplet. It's a little, it encapsulates the heart, I think, of Mormon theology. And if you ever forget what it is, just remember, with Mormonism, it always starts with man, not God. So as man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. But Isaiah 43.10 before me, there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Next chapter, Isaiah 44. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Is there a God beside me? Yeah, I know none other. There is no other rock. Notice, too, he's not making us the reference point. He's the reference point. So a lot of Mormons will say, oh, yes, I believe those passages. He's the only God for us. And that reminds me of, of being in the kitchen or the dining room. My wife makes manicotti. And I, looked at, I look at her and I say, you are the best wife in the whole world for me. You make the best manicotti in the entire stinking universe in this house. <laughs> you know, or my son might say, daddy, you're the best daddy in the whole world, but soon, pretty soon he's going to learn, I'm not the best daddy in the whole world. I'm not. I'm the daddy that God gave to John Caleb. But when we say that God is the best and he's the first and he's the most, we're not the reference point for that. We're not the anchor for that. God didn't learn how awesome he is by meeting you. He, he was the reference point for his own supremacy before you were even born. Before you existed, God was the most high. So, anyway, I kind of get carried away there. But. So, uh, I've always tried to focus on this issue in Mormonism of the genealogy of the gods, the generations of the gods. Mormonism teaches that there's a, there's a cycle, there's an eternal round that we can further the generations of the gods. We can become a god. Someday we have spirit children who are under us by implication. Billions of spirit children who are worshiping us. Holy, holy, holy is Vermon Almighty who was and is and is to come. The Almighty, the only God. Blah, blasphemy. Can you imagine that? Your spirit kid's worshiping you someday. But that's, a, that's what it is in Mormonism. There's a, ge, there's a genealogy of the gods. Gods can do their genealogy and figure out who's the great grandpa. Great, you know, so my, my son John Caleb asked me one day, really young, first time ever, says, Daddy, what's a Mormon? Here's my, you know, here we go. A Mormon is a very nice person who believes that God has a grandpa. And I've been teaching John Caleb, God's the best. He's the most. He's the highest. He wins all the arm wrestling matches. He's the boss of everyone. He's faster than everyone. He's taller than everyone. He's bigger than everyone. John Caleb gets it. He's six years old. Yes! So when I tell him they believe God is a grandpa, he goes, what? No, Dad, you need to teach them about God. So you're right, John Caleb. So every Thursday night, I say, John Caleb, I'm going to Temple Square to 
tell people how God is the best. All right? So I used to, I, I've been focusing on this issue for a while, but, you know, one day it hit me like a ton of bricks. Mormonism says, as man is, God once was. Well, man is a sinner. If I become a god someday, my kids won't be able, my spirit children, so to speak, won't accurately be able to save me. Aaron, the Most High, was never a sinner. Oh, no, no, no. So, there's this suggestion, at least in Mormonism, that God the Father was once a sinner before he became a god. Now, I have to be very careful here, because I'm, I, I want you to be accurate, I want you to be careful and discerning about this. I don't want you to stereotype your Mormon neighbor as believing God was a sinner. It's a lot more complicated than this, but it's not that complicated. So um, I started asking about this issue to my to some guys, uh, acquaintances who are Mormon apologists and friends and neighbors and people in the street. But the apologists, the defenders, they, they were saying things like, Oh, Aaron, this, you're, you're cooking this up in the imagination of your mind. We do not believe that God was ever a sinner. It's official Mormon doctrine that God never was a sinner. And I thought, what? Where do you get that from? And, uh, man, it just threw me for a loop, and they were accusing me of misrepresenting Mormonism. So I was like, fine, I'm getting a video camera, I'm going down to Temple Square, and I'm doing video interviews with Mormons. And so that's what I did. And I'll play one little clip with you, for you. Like God the Father could have been a sinner in a past mortal probation? Um, I do. You know, I think that making mistakes... So, sorry. I asked, I asked on the street, do you believe it's possible that God the Father was once possibly a sinner before he became a God? And he says, I do. I think that making mistakes is basically part of life. And here's how he explains. It's part of a, uh, an essential part of a learning process. So, I mean, if you follow logic and reason, um, then, I, then I think that's definitely a distinct possibility. Sure. Does it, it doesn't make him any less powerful or anything. Does it bother you that you'd be worshiping a God who was once like us in the sense that he was a sinner? I mean, no, it makes me more comfortable, actually. So, I mean, in the sense that uh, that we have hope to overcome. You know, if he could overcome and become as great as he is, then, uh, then certainly we have hope to, to overcome all of our trials and, and sinful natures as well. So. so I want you to catch that. It's very important. Um, if you follow logic and reason, he says, it's a, very, it's a distinct possibility that God the Father was once a sinner. And it makes him, in his worship of God, feel more comfortable with God because if, if God was a sinner and he overcame his weaknesses and became a God, he thinks, well, I can do that too. Now, are Mormons taught on Sunday morning or in the manuals that God was a sinner explicitly? No. So they'll tell you, oh, we, yeah, we don't hear that on Sunday. I've never heard that before. But when they put the pieces of their worldview together and they connect the dots, it, it gets fleshed out as a, as a likely or possible implication. So when I, when I talk, I talk to a lot of Mormons about this issue. I press this issue because, you know, we've got so many things we can talk about with our Mormon neighbors. We've got, we've got two agendas here. One is Mormons claim to be Christian and they use the same terminology with different definitions. And so we want to do something called boundary maintenance. And that is to draw a clear line in the sand and say, no, uh, 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 uh. We, biblical Christians... We hold to a core set of beliefs that are essential to the Christian faith. Mormonism jettisons every single one of those at their heart. And so Mormonism's over there. Way different. Distinct religion. Biblical Christianity is over there. And so, uh, you know, your son or daughter starts dating a Mormon in, in, in high school or junior high or college. And what do you do? You try to explain how different it is, how serious it is. This happens all the time. And so boundary maintenance, before we even get to evangelism, boundary maintenance, helping your, the people you love and the public understand just how different Mormonism and Christianity are. We could talk about a dozen, a thousand different topics that differentiate the two. But we've got to focus on what most matters. Well, what most matters? And I thought about this. I was like, okay, I'm going to spend the rest of my life, God willing, pressing this issue. 
of the differences between Mormonism and Christianity. And I'm going to reach out to the Mormon people. Well, what are the, what most matters? If I'm going to pour my whole life into this, if I'm going to move all the way out to Utah, and I'm and my, and bring all my, my wife and, and, and my, put my kids in Utah, I'm just going to thrust my whole life into it. I want to focus on what really matters. Well, polygamy doesn't really matter. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah, but coffee, yeah, yeah, it matters. Whether the Book of Mormon is a, a testament of Jesus, yeah, that really matters. But you know what matters more than anything? God. There is no upgrade. He is not a means to a greater end. So to focus on the nature of God, because all, all good things come from God. Our doctrine of grace comes from who God is. So, um, so I started hitting the streets. And I started asking Mormons, do you believe, and this is important, when you, when you guys do this in conversation, do not ask, was God once a sinner? Because you, you're just giving them an easy way out to obfuscate, to not think about it very clearly. Don't ask that question. Because Mormons, more often than not, they're not taking the, the definitive, conclusive position that God was a sinner. They're saying, well, we don't know. And it would make sense. Like he said, if you use logic and reason. So there's this continuum of Mormons thinking God definitely sinned and God definitely did not sin. And most Mormons are like right here. He probably sinned, he possibly sinned, he likely sinned, he definitely sinned. They're all over the spectrum there. So what I do is I just say, this is how I ask it today. Do you believe, and to me this is, uh, there's no silver bullet for reaching Mormons, but to me this is a key question. Do you believe that God the Father was, words ch chosen carefully here, once perhaps, do you believe that God the Father was once perhaps a sinner? Okay? And uh, the essential answer is I've got. Sure, it's very, you guys see that? Is it not readable? Is it readable? Sure, it's possible. It says, you know, God, it's one eternal round, this one Mormon says. I think it's the same process that go, keeps going on and on and on throughout eternity. So yeah, it's very possible that he was a normal man like us at some point in time in another world. It's cool. I got to follow up with this guy and have uh, dinner with him at my house afterwards. Um, here later, skip. Young guy. Was God the Father once possibly a sinner? He said, absolutely. He went through the same things we did. He knows. We're going to touch on this later. God knows what we're going through. So he sees in God the Father a sympathetic high priest, as it were, because God was once a sinner. For him, it was more probable or definite. And he, and he obviously lived his life right because he became a god. You don't get this kind of explicit clarity in the modern literature from out of BYU. There's no substitute for just talking to people on the street. It assures me, this is how it functions for him, it assures me that I can also always do better and become like unto God, like the scriptures tell us also. And that's absolutely an inspiration to my life. To my life, more accord, to live my life, I didn't write that right, to the ways of the church, according to the ways of the church, because that's obviously where we all want to get. So, um, I'm not making this up. That's kind of like my first point here. Because Mormons look at me and you're making that up. You're just maliciously misrepresenting our religion. I was like, dude, I've talked to thousands of Mormons about this. I've read your manuals. I've talked to 70s. I've talked to BYU professors. I've talked to seminary professors. I've talked to institute teachers. And here's the pattern. About two-thirds of Mormons will say God was once perhaps a sinner. And one-third will say no. Okay? One-third of Mormons will say God was never a sinner. There's diversity there. That's the real pattern I see. Very consistent pattern. But it's not just the folk, as it were. It's also the fine. It's not just the street level. It's also the academic level. Now, in Mormon academia, are they talking about this publicly, explicitly? No, they're avoiding this subject, like the plague, but I love to press it. Um, so you can, uh, by the way, a homework assignment for you guys. Go home, 
sit down, get a drink, have the kids take a nap, and spend 20 to 25 minutes watching the main video at GodNeverSend.com and allow God to provoke within you consternation, righteous anger, and brokenheartedness over these people. Oh, no, no, no! They don't know the God of the universe. God is so much bigger than this. I can't believe I'm hearing this. I need, let it provoke you into just, I'm going to get prepared and go talk to my Mormon friends and neighbors and strangers and family. Let's do it. Hey, guys, let's go out uh, Saturday night, Friday night. Let's, let's hook up with Rob Roy. Let's, let's go out and be intentional and hook up in places where we can naturally intercept Mormon people and have conversations with them and hand out literature to them and plead with them and preach to them and converse with them. Let it, let it provoke your heart to that. So I'll just, I'll just read one Mormon academic. It's one of the very prominent one. His name is Robert Millett, BYU professor. Not a fan. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to provoke this issue. And there was this, went to the, I think it was a Methodist church, interfaith dialogue, very quasi-ecumenical. Uh, rainbow banners on the, the walls. Um, evangelical gets up. And, um, oh, heck, I'll say it. They, they kind of look like uh, spiritual kissing contests and the, just the, the, the differences, the, the radical chasm between Mormonism and Christianity just gets blurred. So I'm like, oh, man. So open mic time. So I come and I ask Robert Millett, I, I said two questions. One, do you believe, and this is just my way of provoking the issue, um, be patient with me, all right? This is my way of trying to hit, hit the issue with, a hot button, right? Two questions. Do you believe that God the Father... I'm sorry. Do you believe that a practicing homosexual can repent of his sin and be covered by the blood of the Savior and eventually be exalted unto Godhood? Second question. Since you've said we don't know much about God the Father's past, do you believe it's possible that God the Father was once perhaps a practicing homosexual before he became a god? And it was like, you heard a pin drop for like five seconds, and for some weird reason, some guy in the back just started going. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Robert Millett was like, that's a very interesting question. And he said... By the way, the, the Christian on stage actually rebuked me for asking the question, told me I was causing a spirit of, of conflict in the room. Um, I mean, can you ma imagine an Athanasius <laughs> um, or Luther on this issue um, or Jesus? Je Jesus is not as nice as we are. We are much nicer than Jesus on stuff like this, if I may say that. Robert Millett says, does my lack of knowledge of God's past cause me to go so far as to speculate that he might have been a sinner on another world? You mention a specific sin. I would say a sin, sinner of any kind. This is one of the most prominent academic spokesmen, academic informal spokesmen on Mormonism in the world. And he says, I just don't know enough about that. My six-year-old knows enough about that. This is not complicated. He's not dumb. This is not a question of being misinformed. This is a matter of repentance. This is a matter of having your heart opened to see the light of the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. All I can say, he goes on, is that the only God I know, speaking in the present tense, is the God I know now. Your question, though fascinating, all I can say is I don't know anything about it. Jesus spoke with authority. BYU professors speak with plausible deniability. Do I think it is possible that God was a practicing homosexual in another world? No. So he's saying that specific sin, no. He won't, doesn't say why. And then he qualifies it with something, uh, just, 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 please, just let your jaw drop with me. 
But that's just a personal response. That's not a church response. God is God, more of the present tense. He possesses, present tense, all the attributes of godliness and perfection. And as far as I know, that's a really important Mormon sort of qualification, as far as we're concerned, as far as we know, he's been God forevermore. What, are, what we are to understand by Joseph Smith's statement and Lorenzo Snow's statement, as man as God once was, and beyond what is made by those two people, I know not. I wish I could say more, but that's all my answer. Uh, it's two ways to be arrogant, by the way, among others. One is to say you know more than you really do. The other is to say you know less than you really do. Has God sufficiently revealed himself to humanity and especially to educated BYU professors such that we can know that he never was a horrific sinner in need of the blood of another savior? Yeah. So fair, I was kinda, it's kinda, kinda sick that I'm happy about this, but I was happy that fair is the foundation for apologetics and informa information research. This is the Mormon uh, apologetic organization. Um, this is, these are the big, big shots for Mormonism, to defend Mormonism. And they came out with a, uh, a statement on their wiki that said, basically, it doesn't matter if God sinned. We don't know. It's possible. Whatever. So, okay. So, let's breeze through as fast as we can. Why do Mormons think this way? I've already given you, well, just real quickly here. Book of Mormon doesn't teach this stuff. Book of Mormon's quasi, it, it, is, it is monotheistic, it's neo-evangelical, and it's 1830 theology. Mormonism radically changed after that. And in 1844, Joseph Smith preached one of his last sermons called the King Follett Discourse. If you're going to do evangelism to Mormons, pretty, pretty good thing to know. Just give it a read. Teaches God, Joseph Smith says, God himself was once as we are now as an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens goes on to say, I'm going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God, oh, sorry, you can't really read that, can you? We've imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea. One of my evangelistic sort of conversation starters is a Moroni 818 tract. Um, love to show it to you later, where I, I show Moroni. Can I, can I, starting point, hey, can I share a verse of the Book of Mormon with you? Well, sure. Moroni 818. Moroni 818 says, we know that God is not a partial God, neither a changeable being, but is unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity. So do you agree with that? And they say, yeah, because of the Book of Mormon, right? So flip it around to the King Fall Discourse statement here, where Smith says, we have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take, and take away and do, do away the veil so that you may see. These are incomprehensible ideas to some, but they are simple. So if Mormon says, that's way deep. Well, Joseph Smith said it was simple. Here then is eternal life to know the only true and wise God. You have got to learn how to be gods yourselves and to be kings and priests to God. The same as all the gods have done before you, implying a past genealogy of the gods. So that's encapsulated in that Lorenzo Snow couplet. So of the one-third one -third of Mormons who say God never sinned, usually the way they rationalize that is that they say, well, among the genealogy of the gods, and I'm saying this much more explicitly than you would hear from Mormons themselves, but if you flesh it out, among the genealogy of the gods, some of them sufficiently prove themselves worthy in pre-mortality before coming to earth to experience a mortal probation, and they're considered a god before they ever become a human. So Jesus, sorry if this is just, woo, well, it's, whatever, uh, a lot of Mormons say, well, Jesus became a God before he came to earth, and he never sinned, and he came to earth to get a body to complete the progression process and to save us, and maybe that's what God the Father did in a previous generation. Maybe God the Father was a sinless, sinless savior for another world, for a different set of spirit children. You get it? So among the gods of the universe, maybe when you become a God, you'll send your firstborn son and he will be sinless. So we just got lucky in the multiverse. We got one of the gods who never sinned, maybe. Well, that doesn't solve the problem. That just pushes it back one step. So 
I like to ask Mormons who go that route, well, I say, okay, well, if you become a god, will your spirit children be able to say of you that you never were a sinner? Or will you tell them the truth, at least? <laughs> we'll get to back to that. So for discernment, when a Mormon tells you in conversation, in evangelism, on the street, on the internet, they say, no, we believe God never sinned. Do not go Richard Mao on me and stop there. You ask good, discerning, patient, Kind, calm, follow-up questions that probe and probe and probe and probe. Because what you see on the surface is not often what is beneath. Sometimes Mormons really do mean it. Don't assume automatically they're being deceptive with you. Mormonism does have an epidemic, cultural, institutional, traditional problem of deception and obfuscation, milk before meat, withholding facts that you're asking about. But give them the benefit of the doubt on, a, on an individual basis. So they might really mean it. They might really mean they believe God never was a sinner and they're not pulling one on you. That really I love meeting Mormons who believe God never sinned. I said, that's great. Join me in calling your fellow Mormons to repentance who believe God was once perhaps a sinner. Join me in calling your church leadership to repentance for not having an official position on whether God the Father was once a sinner. They have official positions on whether you should drink caffeine and energy drinks and coffee, but they can't tell you about whether God was a sinner. That's sad. Okay, so, but a Mormon might mean by God never sinned. Sorry if this is just like really like, oh my goodness, but you have to do the hard work here of just planning for discerning, probing questions. Mormons might say, Oh, God never sinned. But, you know, just culturally, a lot of times, Mormons are so concerned about their image and, like, the image of their church. And so sometimes it's just reactionary, and they're, they're in a tight spot. You're making them, it's embarrassing. And so they're not even telling you what they think. They're just telling you what they think you want to hear. And so if you love them, probe deeper. Because you don't, you're not looking for, just superficial answers. You're looking for the heart. So, but a Mormon might say, God never sinned, but what they really mean is, well, God never sinned as God. Before he became a God, maybe he was a sinner, but as God, once he achieved Godhood, exaltation, from that point on, he never was a sinner. Well, they might say, well, God never sinned, but by never, what I really meant 10 minutes ago was that in this eternity, as far as we're concerned, God never was a sinner, but perhaps there was a prior eternity where God was a sinner. Or, uh, like Robert Millet said, um, it's as far as we are concerned. So I say, well, God never sinned, but what I really meant 10 minutes ago when I said that was, as far as it concerns us, or as far as it is even relevant to us, we might as well just say he never sinned. Or, hey, if God was a sinner, he would have received the blood of another Savior and his sins would have been covered and forgiven. So it's as though he never was a sinner. Just like us, right? Right? We're forgiven. We're forgiven by the atonement. And it's as though we never sinned. So let's just treat God like he never was a sinner. It's as though he never sinned. Let's just wink at it and, you know, cut him some slack. Or they're just saying God never sinned and what they really mean is they don't know and it's not that they're denying that he never sinned. They're just lacking in affirmation that he sinned, if that makes any sense. So, I mean, tons of different variants on this. you got to dig and dig and dig and dig and dig and dig. So I like to ask Mormons, just kind of cut through a lot of that, to get at their heart, kind of like the doctor that taps the knee and see if there's something there, you know? Well, if you met another Mormon who said God was once probably or possibly a sinner, would that bother you? And most Mormons who say, God never sinned, when asked that follow-up question, will say, ah, not, not a big deal. So you, it's, it's an open, let's talk about this, this is important. So, and you know, this is just my way of trying to fester the issue here, because it's important. This is an obsession I have, and I think it's okay. If God was a sinner, what sins might he have committed? Mormonism teaches that there are some sins that, if you commit, disqualify you from becoming a god. So, if you commit blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, or if you go through the temple, uh, violate your covenants inasmuch as you even commit murder, or some Mormons would say second-time adultery, 
a little ambiguity in that. There's some, Mormon, there's some teaching, there, there's some sins in Mormonism that if you commit, permanently disqualify you from achieving celestial exaltation under Godhood. So Mormonism teaches, for example, traditionally, that King David won't become a god, won't go to the celestial kingdom, won't dwell with Heavenly Father forever because of what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah. So, okay, let's consider all the sins that we can think of. Removing second-time adultery, removing murder. What other sins might God the Father have committed, repented of, been forgiven for, before he became a god? Let's just sit on it for a while. Let's just camp on this and think about it. Adultery, arrogance, bestiality, blasphemy, bitterness, bribery, callousness, child abuse, coveting, cowardice, cruelty, drunkenness, false prophecy, gossip, hatred, the bad kind, the practice of homosexuality. It's important to qualify that these days. Idolatry, laziness, leading children astray, lovelessness, lust, lying, pedophilia, pornography, rape. Are you willing to worship a God who was once a rapist? He's forgiven, forgiven, though. We're not worshiping that God. Resentment, spousal abuse, stealing Ponzi schemes, unfaithfulness, unjustified anger, Violence, voyeurism, witchcraft. So Mormons, they want to mentally disso dissociate themselves from this issue. Not, uh, ooh, I don't like to think about that. Press it. So are you okay with your God having once perhaps committed these kinds of sins? That doesn't bother you? Because when I go to church, we sing, How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. You put this in my mind? That God once perhaps did that? I'm not singing that to that God. No way, Jose. I am not giving my worship. By God's grace, I hope I never, ever give such worship to a God who was once a sinner like that. It's kind of a negative and a positive issue, and it's kind of ugly in contrast with beautiful. This is icky, but let me lift your, your heart up here, okay? This is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to give you 13, if you need, as if you needed 13 reasons to believe God never was a sinner. I'm going to give you 13 reasons why God never was a sinner. All right? And just consider it a worship service. We're going to have some worshipful Bible reading and some worshipful syllogisms, some deductive logic. And this is all going to paint a picture of the beauty of the glory of God because you know what? What I'm doing here is essentially what evangelism is. You paint a picture of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. You lift him up. You make him look good. You're an ambassador. And you pray that God would open their heart to see the light of the gospel and love it and be enthralled by it. But what can you do but paint the picture? Can't open their eyes. But let's paint the picture at least. Let's put a mosaic up. And don't you dare share these verses with Mormons in a boring manner. It's a crime. There's an attitude in this text. Not mere propositional content, but also an attitude. There's a flavor to this ice cream. What's the flavor of Trinitarian monotheism? Well, let that exude from your nonverbal communication and verbal communication. Because there's a holistic presentation going on here. Not just the meaning, but the manner. I, Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you, ever you had even formed the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Thou, I want to get King Jimmy on him, thou Art God from everlasting to everlasting. Put it in a syllogism. God has always been God. God as God 
has never sinned. Therefore, God never sinned. Number two, because we shouldn't limit our worship of God. God, I love the way you are today. Remember Robert Millet? Today, now. But 3.5 billion years ago, you were something else. So I'm going to mentally block out what God was. I'm going to mentally dissociate myself from what God perhaps was in the past. And I'm only going to worship him for who he is today and who he will be in the future. No! You worship God for all of who he is. There's nothing embarrassing about God's past. When you go to heaven someday and you get stuck in an awesome library that talks about all the deeds and thoughts and attributes that have belonged to God from all eternity. You could spend billions of years reading all the books and you would never find anything where you say, ooh, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's black that part out. Ugh. All of God is pure. All of God is beautiful. All of God is awesome. All of God is even terrifying. It is awesome. And it's never been any different. Number three, because God is maximally reliable. He's the most reliable. I love to pile on the superlatives with my little John, Caleb, and Lydia. And let's do the, the passage first. Habakkuk 1.12. Are you not from everlasting Oh, Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. Get it? I'm trusting God today as the Holy One because of who he has always been from everlasting. He's a, he's a solid rock because he's the Holy One from everlasting. Let's put it in this. I didn't really break these out. Syllogisms. The more consistent someone has been, the more reliable they are. Well, there is inconsistency between being a sinner and being sinless. Therefore, a God who never sinned is more reliable than a God who did. God is maximally reliable. Indeed, he's the most reliable of all conceivable beings. A God who never sinned is more reliable than a God who did sin. Therefore, God never sinned. Just... A God who never sinned is more reliable than a God who once did. He's been more consistent. And God's the most reliable of all. Therefore, he never sinned. One of my favorite. Because God is the most high. He's not more high. He's most high. If there's a more above the most, then the most isn't, above, then the most, isn't the most. Mormonism abuses the superlative language of God and it relativizes it, limits it, reduces it. Well, you're the most high for this subset of worlds in the multiverse. It was in Manti. And I, was, I love preaching to teens in Manti. Parents come, sit down for the pageant, have a few hours to kill, tell the teens, see you in a few hours. And they come out of the closed street. You guys got to come. It's awesome. And they come out and talk to us. And I was preaching to a crowd of young kids, and I said, Who has known the mind of the Lord? Romans 11. Who has ever been his counselor? Who's ever been his teacher? Who's ever been God's Sunday school teacher? Right? Who, and the kids, the kids know. They go, <laughs> Who has ever given God a gift that he might be repaid? Oh, thank you very much. I didn't have that before. For, from him, well, by the way, stop, sorry. I said, who has ever known the mind of a Lord, before I went on from that, and this, oh, man, this innocent Mormon little boy said, Joseph Smith has, I said, oh, man, for, from him, and through him, and to him are all things, to him be the glory forever." And Paul stops his iPod and puts his earbuds out and goes, Amen. Because this is song. This is doxology. This is awesome. 
you can read the rest, you can read the syllogisms. Please do, at godnoversin.com. This one's a little heady here, five. So I remember having this conversation at BYU in the cafeteria, and we had a long conversation with this guy, um, talking about God never sinned, and he says, Aaron, when you say God never sinned, you blaspheme God. Explain. Well, what you're really saying is that the atonement isn't powerful enough to cover God's past sins. Get it? So, the atonement in Mormonism is so powerful it can turn a sinner into a most high God. And you're blaspheming the atonement, Aaron, for saying God never sinned. Taco Bell can't sit in your stomach when you say it. Like, oh my goodness. Well, what that does is, let's just think about it, make it a little simple. Who would have atoned for Heavenly Father's sins if he was once a sinful mortal? It would not have been Jesus, because Jesus came later. Jesus atones for our sins in Mormonism. It would have been our spirit uncle, or Heavenly Father's spirit brother, or the son of Heavenly, great, heavenly Grandfather, who would have been sent to pay the sacrifice to atone for Heavenly Father's sins. So we're talking about an atonement here accomplished by a different Savior than Jesus Christ. Well, what you've basically done by saying the power of the atonement without reference to Jesus Christ is you've abstracted the atonement across many saviors among the generations of the gods. And this is heady for a second, but Mormonism doesn't like it that we turn gods supposedly into a set of sort of abstract principles in impersonal, unreachable just unknowable God, they, that's how they caricature our God in, in, in sort of a sloppy way. But that's what they've done. In their own religion, the gods are subject to eternal impersonal laws that have no source in a final person. So the atonement is like this abstract impersonal principle that governs the gods. If God the Father was a sinner, then he was redeemed by another savior than Jesus Christ. And related to that, Jesus was the king of kings. Think about this, just in the bigger picture. If you, a sinner, become a god someday, and you send your firstborn son, as it were, to redeem the people that you send to other planets to become gods, what will your spirit children call Jesus? Okay, hear me out. Um... I have a son. Someday, perhaps, he'll have children. Um, what will my son's children call my brother? You guys are asleep. My uncle. So what will Jesus be, allegedly, to my spirit children? Uncle Jesus. You should laugh. And then you should cry. Put it together. It's, 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 an, it's, it's incredible. We should laugh. That's not the Jesus I know. The Jesus I know is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If my spirit kids talk to Jesus like he's their uncle, I will spank them with a celestial spoon. <laughs> and I will say, oh, no, 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 you honor Jesus as you honor the Father, not me. I'm not the Most High. You redirect any worship you were putting my way, and you give it to the Most High God. Eternal life is to know God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, and that will never change. And we mentioned this partly before. Mormons, this, is, this, is just, this took me totally by surprise when I started talking to Mormons about this, because this is not in the literature and it was a consistent response I was hearing. So it was consistent on the street, or often it was common on the street, but it, you, couldn't, you can't find this in any book at the BYU bookstore, the library. Mormons were telling me God never sinned because when his sins were perhaps forgiven, they were remembered no more. 
I said, don't you believe, Aaron, that when your sins are forgiven, they're remembered no more? And I, so I pressed it and I said, so are you literally saying that in the cosmos, God, in the, in the big picture, God literally forgets that we ever sinned? Well, yeah, don't you? I don't think that's what it means when it says remembered no more. When it says that in Jeremiah 31, 34, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. I think what that means, and it's cool about this stuff, is you don't have to make complicated arguments for it. You just present it simply. I think what that means is that God's not going to hold my sins over my head in a condemning manner. Will I forget that I was a redeemed sinner? Will God forget that he redeemed me from my sin? No. Why would I want to forget that? That's awesome. And just, just, just think about this. All these redeemed sinners, the sinners who are redeemed, transformed into saints, adopted, forgiven, taken into heaven, among the angels, in Revelation 5. Well, they're forgiven. They don't need to thank God anymore for re redemption over sin because they just forget it. Well, let's see what they do in Revelation 5. And this is totally relevant. I'm sorry if I'm going over time. Revelation 5. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed a people from God, from every tribe and language and people and nation and city of Arizona, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and and the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And all the living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped the Lamb who was slain because they didn't forget. Their sins, well, the sins of the saints were remembered no more, but they didn't forget about that, did they? Because, and this is probably, oh man, it's up there, one of my favorite reasons to believe God never was a sinner and all these neat texts that we use for other reasons end up being directly relevant here. A sinner saved by grace cannot rightly boast in himself. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, it, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. So, I'm saved a sinner. I've got no ground to boast in myself. If God was publicly forgiven, I'm sorry, if God was forgiven for past sins, he would publicly thank and praise and worship and celebrate the one who forgave him. He would boast in another. But God does not give thanks to anyone for anything. He boasts in himself. And that's a point a lot of people don't know or believe. Therefore, God never sinned. If Heavenly Grandfather... I get that? If Heavenly Father was redeemed by the blood of another lamb, then he ought to be forever singing to this spirit uncle of ours, Worthy is the Lamb who... You get this? If Heavenly Father was redeemed by the blood of another Savior, he ought to be singing to this other Savior other than Jesus Christ, Worthy is that Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and so forth. But God doesn't worship and praise other gods oh my goodness he boasts and god is so full of himself and i love it that way it's great that's where the love of god comes he frees me up to enjoy what's most enjoyable and what's most enjoyable just happens to be god it's, it's really do we call him self-centered do we call him other oriented it's really hard to put you know 
He loves me. He, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. He loves us. He loves us by directing us to him, to him, to him. So I love these Isaiah passages. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? What man shows him his counsel? Whom did God consult? Who made him understand? Isaiah says, God says through Isaiah, Who taught God the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop in the bucket. And they are accounted as dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. To whom then will you compare me that I shall be like him, says the Holy One. And Joseph Smith says, well, heavenly grandfather. Christians say, no one. I love this. Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord, and that is my name. My glory I do not give to another. I give to no other. Sing to the Lord a new song. Vocab, do another one. His praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fills at the coastlands and their inhabitants, all the Canaanites, let the desert and the city and its cities lift up their voice. Let the inhabitants sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Love them. Give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. Don't you dare talk about yourself that way someday to your spirit children. Because you're a redeemed Savior. You, don't, you have no grounds to boast in yourself. And then we go to Isaiah 43, 10. Before me no God was formed, neither shall there be any after me. Isaiah 44. I love this. Good street preaching material, too. Do you guys know who the first God is? Who is the first God? Nobody knows. I know! <laughs> Isaiah 44, verse 6 and 8. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Is there a God beside me? I know of no rock. I know it on any. Totally full of himself, Isaiah 48. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. For my name's sake, comma. For my name's, for my own sake, I do it. For how should I let my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. What redeemed sinner talks like that? I, if I met the Mormon God someday, if he's real, and I die and I meet him, I look at him and say, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, what do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Not worshiping you. Show me where it all comes from. Because of the eternal relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Let's see here. Okay. Projects. Okay, showing you an older version. Sorry, guys. Okay. Another reason to believe God never was a sinner. We're on number nine. <laughs> As if we needed 13 reasons to believe God never was a sinner. It is greater to have never sinned than to have ever sinned. The Son has never sinned. Therefore, the Son is greater than those who have sinned. Get it? Jesus is better than you because he never sinned. If the Father sinned, then Jesus, who never sinned, is greater than the Father. But Jesus is not greater than the Father. Therefore, God never sinned. To sin is not loving of the Son, but the Father has always perfectly loved the Son. Therefore, God never sinned. The Son has eternally worshipped the Father. You believe that, don't you? There's intra-Trinitarian worship going on. The Son has never worshipped a sinner. Therefore, God never sinned. 
And this one's interesting. I think this follows the Acts 17 model of even your own poets have said, like Vocab said yesterday, even the Quran said, he said to this Mormon that Jesus was born of a virgin and is essentially sinless. Well, I like to say, even your own scripture says, in DNC 20, verse 17, by these things we know there is a God in heaven who is infinite and eternal, from everlasting to everlasting, the same unchangeable God. Even your own scripture says, in DNC 76, from eternity to eternity, he is the same and his years never end. Even your own well, this one's difficult. Scriptures say, which you took out in the 18, 1920s, used to be part of their scriptures, the lectures on faith, but they still re revere the source, though. The lectures on faith, section 3, actually quotes Psalm 90, verse 2, which says God's from everlasting to everlasting. It's interesting. Mormons say today, you know, I, I don't really care if God was a sinner. It doesn't, it's not relevant to me. It's not relevant to my faith and repentance. But here's what Mormon scriptures said at the time. Here's what the lectures on faith said. A correct idea of God's character, perfections, and attributes is necessary in order that any rational and intelligent being may exercise faith in God unto life and salvation. Agreed? Yes. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Thou art God. I mean, it's quoting the KJV, I think. He changes not, neither is there variables with him, but he is the same from everlasting to everlasting, being the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that his course is one eternal round without variation. This is good stuff. Why don't you believe it anymore? Moroni 7.22. God, knowing all things, comma, being from everlasting to everlasting, and my favorite, Moroni 8.18, God is unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity. Mormonism has apostatized from the Book of Mormon. Mormonism has abandoned the core teachings of the Book of Mormon on the nature of God. And this one is me appealing to the conscience of my audience. Even Mormon children agree that God never sinned at Manti when I'm on the street and I talk to all these beautiful children. I love these kids. I love these kids. They bring me to tears. I love these kids. Pretty consistent pattern. If they haven't been to LDS seminary yet, you guys know what seminary is in Mormonism yet? Ask your friends. If they haven't been to LDS seminary yet, God never sinned. There's no God above God. God's always been God. And as soon as they start going through seminary, for some reason, all these kids, these older high school kids are like, yeah, I mean, maybe God was a sinner. Maybe and he's, you know, maybe there are an ancestry of the gods. And So I like to look at Mormon parents and say, your children innocently and rightly and beautifully know that God never was a sinner. They get it. Don't you dare teach them otherwise. Now, what did Jesus say about this? Matthew 18. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to, to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Oh, my... Uh, I was talking to a guy about this, Manti, an older guy. And he said, well, it's kind of like your children. They kind of think you have a God, right? And they think you're perfect. And then someday they find out you weren't. It's just like that with us and God. <laughs> oh, really? Well, my son, John Caleb, knows that I'm a sinner. And I teach him from day one, your daddy needs Jesus. And he makes a lot of sinful mistakes. And he goes, yes, daddy, I agree. You make a lot of mistakes. And that's good. I want him to know that. Okay, probably skipped a few because this is the new version, but if you're on time, over time. Reason number 12, as though we needed all these reasons. Jesus is our sympathetic high priest. So Mormons say, it comforts me. It's an inspiration to me that God was once perhaps a sinner because it means me, a sinner, can become a God. And God knows what I'm going through because he was once, some would say, a sinner. I have this as a, in a manner of speaking, a sympathetic high priest in the Father because he knows what it's like to be a sinner. What does the Bible say about this? The sympathetic high priest that we have is his sympathy, is his empathy with you born out of an experience of having been a sinner. It's the opposite. Since then, we have a great high priest 
who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who, in every respect, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to, to help in time of need. So the, the best high priest you have is the best high priest you have because he never sinned. C.S. Lewis has an awesome thought on this. You know, no one knows how bad he is until he has tried to be very good. A silly idea that good people do not know what... A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. After all, you find out the strength of the German army by fighting against it, not by giving in. So when you guys see an ad on Fox News with uh, best and worst beach bods, and you click it, and then one thing happens to another, and you're faced with, do I keep going, do I keep going, do I keep going, and you plunge and you plunge and you plunge. What you're doing is, is you're releasing the pressure. You're not resisting the temptation. You're giving it in. You're giving into it. You find out the strength of a wind by trying to walk against it, not by lying down. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like hours later. That is why bad people, in a sense, know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life by always giving in. We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside of us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only man who who never never yielded to temptation is also the only man who knows to the full what temptation means the only complete realist the sympathetic empathetic high priest that I have that by the way I'm allowed to directly talk to is who he is because he never sinned and then okay this is definitely my favorite reason to believe God never was a sinner and I'll I'll preface it with a story I remember having a conversation with this lady at Temple Square and I'm pressing this issue, I'm pressing this issue. And she goes, why does this matter? Why does it matter whether God was ever a sinner? What, why does it even matter if he was ever the first God? And I said, well, he, the greatest purpose in life that we have is to know and love and enjoy and praise and worship God. That's the highest pleasure. That's the highest purpose. She goes, it's not like God wants you to worship him forever. So, two responses to this beloved neighbor of mine. Not literal neighbor, but neighbor in humanity. Revelation 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne, and he who sat there, help, help you guys out here. Oh, come on, Logos. Is it Logos, Logos, Logos? I never know how to say it. And he who sat there, verse 3, had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God, and before the throne there was as it were a a sea of glass, like crystal. He doesn't even know how to describe it. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, by the way. What kind of God are we dealing with here that he creates these creatures to do nothing but what we're about to hear? And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second creature like an ox, the, se- the third living creature like the face with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, 
full of eyes all around and within, and day and night, they, they have no more clocks, by the way, probably, for this. They don't need any. Day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Doesn't need any interpretation. Second answer. When we've been there 10,000 billion, 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 billion years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. What praise? What praise will we be essentially singing to God? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. My God doesn't sing that song! My God does not say, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. My God was never a wretch. He was never blind. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He has always been pure and lovely and righteous and awesome. And there is no other God that I will give my two children than that God. Oh, no. I just a quote I want to share with you. C.S. Lewis says in his journey, his biography, it was when I was happiest that I longed the most, that I longed most. The sweetest thing in all my life has been the longing to find Actually, this is Till We Have Faces, not his actual biography, but representative of his biography. The sweetest thing in all my life has been, to, has been the longing to find the place where all the beauty comes from. If God was a sinner, he's not where all the beauty comes from. My, to- my friend Tom says, the human heart cannot satisfy the human heart. If Mormonism is true, the, lo- the universe is a lonely place because my heart was built to love a much greater God than Mormonism gives me. So please, my friends, make this a sticking point, a pressure point, a pivot point in your boundary maintenance and in your evangelism to the Mormon people. Because we have an awesome God. And evangelism is the spilling, the overflow of the painting of the portrait of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus and praying that their eyes would be opened. Real simple. Thanks, guys. I know that went over time. So. <laughs>